Hello everybody and welcome again to confirmation class. We're going to continue with the sacrament of the altar. We're going to pick up where we left yes, or last week and also get into one of the two lessons today. Uh, but just to get us reminded about where we're at, here we had our first week of Zooms with the presentations. And most of you uh, were able to uh, give me your presentation via Zoom. And like I told each one of your groups, and I'll just remind you again now, is that by next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, when I meet with you again, uh, we want to have those uh, speeches memorized so that we can work on the delivery, okay? Also, uh, I have been getting a lot of your summaries, and I thank you for that. Some of them are very, very good summaries on uh, where you've uh, regurgitated to me what you've learned on these videos. Uh, there's four of you who don't have any of them in for me yet, and I won't mention names, but you know who they are. Hopefully you're watching the video. I do notice, uh, you know, with, with, with YouTube, you can find out how many views you have. And I'm noticing that you are watching the videos. Uh, some of you don't seem to be watching the second one, though, because of the numbers in the first video, first half. Remember, there's two parts to it. Uh, this one will have two parts, too. The uh, first one is usually usually has more numbers than the second one. Now, um, hopefully it's because maybe you're turning it off just a tad early. Uh, but to please watch the whole thing, okay? This is more interesting than anything else you do anyway, right? Right. Okay. I'm glad you all agreed with that. Because we are studying God and salvation and why we're here. We're answering the most important questions of your life, okay? Even though when you're 13, 14, uh, and 15, you, you, don't, you don't maybe think that way because of where you're at, but it's the truth, okay? It's what's going to bring you through all of your high points and your low points in life, and it's going to bring you through death into eternity because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We're now in that Easter season. And uh, you can't pay, take the toothpaste and put it back in the tube because nobody's going to take away the resurrection. And that's the most important thing to understand, that Christ has uh, risen and we have salvation and eternal life. And that's what all of this is about. Okay, and the sacrament is about that too. Uh, and we'll be talking about that. All right? Hopefully that's all the commercial I need. Now we'll go ahead and get into it. Last week, I'm thirsty for some reason. Last week, I took you on a little bit of a journey in the Old Testament, and I linked up that whole Old Testament with the New Testament because, once again, I want you guys to understand that the Bible, your Christian faith, is not a blind faith, right? Uh, in the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. In the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed. And I showed that to you in regards to the whole Passover and the Passover meal and why Jesus is, in the context of the Passover meal, uh, uh, that last particular Thursday before he is crucified, and why he longed to celebrate that particular Passover, because he was going to institute uh, the Holy Supper, and he did on that Monday Thursday. So uh, uh, I, I went over all that and the details and so what we're going to do now is start moving into the nuts and bolts about what Holy Communion is and what happens in that meal. And so in your catechisms, if you have them with you, page 322, we ask the question, what is the sacrament of the altar? The sacrament of the altar, it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us uh, Christians to eat and drink. When did he institute this? Maundy Thursday, right? Over the Passover meal. Where is it written? Well, the Holy Evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and St. Paul have it written. And you, you hear the words of institution almost every Sunday you go to church, right? Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That is what's called the words of institution. And when the pastor, at the last part of the service, brings the elements, the bread and the wine, and says those words, he institutes the Holy Supper. Through the words, okay, the Word of God does everything that has anything to do with creation and salvation, right? God's act is always through His words. So those words are the institution, and when those words are applied, then the body and blood come and become joined with the bread and wine in the Holy Supper for us to eat and drink for the forgiveness of our sins. And we're going to answer some questions as to why God does this. We already talked about the fact, and I've brought it up more than once, that God joins his word, his promise, his salvation to elements. And he's done it all the way through the Old Testament. And when we think of the sacraments, what do we think of? He joins his word of promise with the water in baptism, and he does so now with the bread and the wine in Holy Communion. And what does he say? This is my body. This is my blood. He does not say this represents or figurative language why saying, you know, I want you to think of this as my bread or my body and blood, but it's really just bread and wine. There's no figurative language involved in him saying this. So we're going to go over why we have to understand that. And, and this is a a, a dispute within Christianity, all right, in regards to what does Jesus mean? Is the body and blood truly present? And the answer is yes, and we're going to make that clear today, okay? And it's very important for us to understand that. That's why we have something called closed communion, and that has to do with uh, if you do not recognize the body and blood of, of, of Christ, uh, then uh, to, to commune within our church would not be appropriate because of, of, of the differences of opinion. And there's a part in, in Corinthians where we're going to talk about how uh, the Apostle Paul says you don't want to take Holy Communion in an unworthy manner. And with those words as pastors, we, we take it therefore a, a responsibility for us to make sure that you understand what Holy Communion is, and you're about to take Holy Communion for the first time. And I want you to not only understand what's really happening, I want you to be able to appreciate what's actually going on between you and your Savior, and between you and your fellow Christian when we come together around God's table to receive Holy Communion, okay? And I hope that happens for all of us. All right, first of all, I'm going to go into the scriptures now, and I, I just read it there. Our Bible, we have four Gospels. The first three Gospels, we call them the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three all have the words of institution in them. The words of institution is also in uh, one of the letters of the Apostle Paul, and that's in 1 Corinthians. Let me first speak about the type of language here, okay? Because somebody could come in and say, now wait a minute. How come you believe that it really is the body and blood? Isn't, hasn't Jesus in other parts of the scripture spoken in a symbolic language? What would you say? Would you say that in other parts of the scripture, or are there parts in the Gospels where Jesus speaks figuratively? Yes or no? How many of you say yes, raise your hand. How many of you say no, raise your hand. Well, the answer is yes. Jesus speaks symbolically a lot. There are times where you hear him say something like, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless those kinds of things. He's, he's very emphatic and he's, he's speaking literally and he speaks literally a lot as well. But whenever Jesus goes into parables, for instance, he's speaking figuratively. 
He's giving you a story. It may or may the story itself may or may not be true, but like anybody else who would come up with a story to make a point, Jesus is doing that. So he has all kinds of figurative language. He also uses because somebody could, if somebody was really good with their Bible and disagreed with the understanding of the, what we call the real presence of Christ, which is the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament. So what if somebody came up uh, to you and said, oh, you believe in the real presence? Well, then tell me this. Why didn't you pluck your eye out a long time ago? Because in the scripture, remember, Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to go into heaven or go into go into heaven with one eye than to have two eyes and end up in hell. If your arm causes you to sin, cut it off. Right? He said that. What Jesus is clearly using in that text is what we call hyperbole. It's definitely hyperbole. And you can find that. You can look at it within the context of what's being said. He's speaking figuratively there. All right? Then that person might say, well, how do you know he's not speaking figuratively when he says the words of institution within the sacrament? Well, one of the main points we have to recognize is that Jesus, in this case, is not speaking figuratively, and we can know that for sure because he's using what we call testamental language. Notice the context. In the midst of the uh, Passover meal, he's taking these things and in the consecration of it, he's saying, this is the, uh, my blood of the what? New Testament. It's testamental language. It's the difference between using, uh, let's say you were to write a book about something and you use figurative language to make your point. Uh, any of you want, uh, ever read uh, C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, you'll see that he, what, uses figurative language throughout the whole thing, where you've got a lion that represents Jesus and all these different figurative aspects of it, and it's like painting a picture. Uh, that's not what Jesus is doing when he's doing the words of institution, when he's saying these words, he's using testamental language. It's parallel to uh, what kind of language would you use if you uh, were to uh, put together a will or a testament. If you put a will together, are you going to use figurative language or are you going to use literal language? You're going to use literal language, just like Jesus is doing when he's putting together a covenant, right? He's speaking covenantially or in a testament. So therein we can see that the type of language he's using tells you that it is uh, it is to be taken literally. Now we have that, and that should be enough for you. You know, a lot of people will say, well, he says is, this is, right? And there's no figurative language in what he's saying in regards to that whole context. But we even have more than that in order to make this point clear. And this is where I want to bring you to uh, 1 Corinthians to even elaborate on this point. Uh, so that you can understand that the scriptures is clear that there is what's called the real presence of Christ in the sacrament. And I'll get to why that's so important in a little bit. Now if you go to 1 Corinthians, let me give you a little history of, of the church of Corinth, what's happening here. The 1 Corinthians is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to a church who is messing up and messing up really big. So if you think about the Apostle Paul after he got converted, one of the things that Paul did is he went on three, at least three missionary journeys where he established churches in the Gentile regions. And he did it very successfully. And one of those churches that he established was the Church of Corinth. And in the Church of Corinth, he spent time there, he established it, he put pastors in there, and uh, he stayed with them for a while. And then he left. Right. And after he left for a while, he got word that everything was falling apart back in Corinth. Part of the reason why that was happening in this church is Corinth was a pagan, or even with the church being there, it was a pagan uh, city. A lot of bad stuff going on, a lot of sinful things going on. It was a seaport uh, uh, 
community as well and a lot of pagan worshiping going on. I'm not going to get into all the details, but so what you have to remember is when, when, when Paul established this church, and this is true if you talk to missionaries in different parts of the world, you'll, you'll, you'll talk to them and they'll tell you, yeah, people convert to Christianity in these areas, but that doesn't mean they don't slip back into their rituals or beliefs that they come out of. It's not always clean. And so what happened is people would kind of go back to their old ways. And part of the reason why the Apostle Paul is writing this is to say, no, 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 you're out of that now. You have to be recognized that you're part of the church community. So there's things you're, you're not supposed to do as a Christian that you thought doing was okay when you were a pagan. Makes sense? And so a whole bunch of things were going on. There was a lot of what they call sectarianism where uh, people were following different people and there was different groups. It would be like um, if here at Emmanuel, since you have three pastors, what if our church as Emmanuel got to the point where uh, the three pastors kind of got into competition over all of you? And so there would be uh, the church of the, the, the section of, of Pastor Stecker, and I thought there's the Stecker followers, and then there's the Pastor Zexer followers, and then there's the Pastor Shoemaker followers and we started getting into competition with each other. What would happen to our church if we did that? It would cause disunity within us. Uh, and that's one thing that your three pastors always work hard at, is that uh, we are three pastors and we fill one office, and we're not in competition with each other as your pastors. Uh, and, and we work really hard at that because we know that could happen. Well, that kind of thing was happening in Corinth. There were other things going on. There was, uh, oh, there was a uh, individual who was sleeping with his stepmother, and the church wasn't doing anything about it. And so, the apostle Paul had directives in regards to that individual and what to do with them. So there are all these things going on. So this letter is, it's a letter of chastisement and saying, hey, you need to straighten these things up. Here are the things you ought to straighten up, right? Well, one of those things was. One of those areas where they were not uh, following uh, the apostles' directives is the Holy Communion. And so when you get to chapter 10, uh, you're going to get to this part where that, well, Paul is going to address this issue. So 10 and 11, I'm going to read certain parts and elaborate on it. So I'm going to start with chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, starting with verse 14, uh, where uh, the Apostle Paul therefore says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. And he's speaking of idolatry. He's going to move into Holy Communion. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the same loaf. Now, listen to that, and, and we're going to look at that word participation. That's the Greek word koinonia. You've been in groups, right, of koinonia groups, which has to do with fellowship or participating in something, in a, in a, in a meeting and everything. So when you take that word and you understand it means a participation in, the Apostle Paul says, that the actual act of communion, when you have that feast, you are actually what? Participating in the body of Christ. This is not figurative. There's no way this can be figurative language. So it coincides with Jesus saying what? This is my body, this is my blood. And here we've got the elaboration of that where the Apostle Paul is reminding them when you take the bread, it is a participation in the blood, when you take uh, in the body, and when you participate in the cup, the wine, it is a participation of the blood of Christ, okay? So when you look at those, um, you, you recognize that he's elaborating on the fact that this is literal stuff, not figurative. Now, if we jump over to chapter 11, he's going to say more about the Lord's Supper, and I'm going to read it. It's chapter 11, starting with verse 17. When, with the in the following directives, I have no praise for you, 
for your meetings do more harm than good. He's talking about meeting together in, and coming together in, around God's word and sacrament and worship. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together in worship, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or you dis do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. And now watch what he says. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. This is really important stuff because the Apostle Paul received from, from in this case would be from the other apostles, maybe from the Lord himself when he spent time with him. But here is what I receive and I'm going to pass it on to you. So what does he say? He's going to give you the words of institution that Jesus said on that last Passover when he instituted Holy Communion. I receive from the Lord what I now pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new, here we go, the new covenant in my blood. This cup has the covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that proclamation has everything to do with remembrance of me. That word remembrance has to do with a commemoration. Okay, a commemoration, remembrance of the Lord as it was a commemoration of, remember last week, uh, the Holy Passover and all the years, okay? Therefore, who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, now he just spoke what the worthy manner is, all right? If you do so in an unworthy manner, you will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. This is not figurative language. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep, which means have died. But it will. Um, but if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. And he goes on from there. So what we have here is, uh, what was going on is that there were groups of people, and in those days, they would actually have the meal together. They would eat together as a church, and then they'd take the bread from the meal and the wine, and then they'd celebrate Holy Communion. Well, there would be those who would be out working in the fields, and they would come in a little later, while the people who were a little bit more privileged would be there first. They would, you know, make... Uh, make pigs of themselves and eat up all the food and drink up all the wine and have their bellies full and also get drunk. And then there uh, wasn't any wine left for Holy Communion. Or if there was, they were in no real condition to what? Receive Holy Communion in a worthy manner. Okay? And notice what's interesting here is what he's doing in several cases here is he's comparing that kind of behavior to what? what has to, should be going on and what does go on in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. A participation in, and here we talk about the, the main point that what God is doing in and through the sacrament is for the forgiveness of sins, okay? So with all that put together, you have to ask the question, it's an important question to ask. Is this figurative or is this real? Is it literal? that the bread and the wine are actually the body and blood of Christ. Well, it's clear in Scripture, Jesus says it is, and the Apostle Paul elaborates on what's actually happening. Now, here is the reason people will go off the beaten path in regards to this. You want to know what the reason is for the most part? Uh, it's because of human reason. All right? 
We can go back in history during the time of the Reformation in the 16th century. Uh, not, Luther was the main reformer, but there were other reformers as well. One was a, a, a guy by the name of Zwingli. Zwingli and Luther agreed on a whole lot of things, but they disagreed on what's happening in the Lord's Supper. Zwingli did not believe in the real presence. Luther did, and that caused division amongst them because this is a really serious issue. Think about it. It either is or it isn't, right? If it isn't really the body and blood of Christ, we ought to not say that it is because, you know, this is important. If it is the body, and if when Jesus says it is, and it means is, and we truly have the very physical presence of Jesus in the sacrament, to say that it isn't would be detrimental, wouldn't it? To suggest that it isn't when it is? So we have to get this right. So it's very important for us to understand that. So there was a division. Now, it's very interesting, some of, some of Zwingli's uh, disagreement had to do with human reasoning. You may, may even be thinking about this too. You're going to take Holy Communion for the first time, and I'll always notice when we give it, um, and I can remember when I took Holy Communion for the first time, I was really wondering, okay, what was this going to taste like? What was it going to be like? What was it going to feel like? And quite honestly, when I took the bread, I thought, wow, that didn't taste like much at all. Wonder Bread back home tastes better. It's true. And the wine, well, the wine was wine, and, and you know, either like wine or you don't. Uh, but what you will taste is what? Bread and wine. You will not taste body and blood. You will not taste human flesh or human blood. You're not a vampire and you're not a cannibal. This has nothing to do with any of that. But human reasoning, if you're just going to go by your human reasoning, what are you going to say? All I'm taking is bread and wine. And so therefore, uh, Jesus must have really meant what? Represents. Because in our human feeling and the taste and everything we know, it's bread and wine. Uh, Zwingli was under that kind of persuasion. And he also talked about things like uh, when Jesus appeared as the resurrected Christ, before uh, the disciples, all the doors were locked because they were afraid and he still appeared to them physically without having to open the door. The point of that text was there was something beyond what we have in regards to our physicality and Jesus was able to present himself without opening the door. Well, Zwingli would have said, well, he probably climbed through a window somewhere and he doesn't, he didn't get, uh, have an understanding or a belief that Jesus could actually do that with his resurrected body. Well, the text says he does, right? And you also have to always remember that you take the text, the word of God, is beyond our human reasoning. You never make human reasoning above God's word. So where I can say the only way God's word makes sense, if it makes sense in my human reasoning, and therefore the word of God has to be the servant of my reasoning. It's the opposite. You and I both know that the Word of God goes beyond our reasoning. And there's all kinds of areas in Scripture where you recognize that. The Holy Trinity, the person of Christ, all kinds of things. The miracles in the Scriptures themselves go beyond human reasoning. Science can never uh, make a statement on a miracle because it's beyond the natural bounds of what we can understand or observe and all that stuff. So the idea that human reasoning should dictate whether... Christ is really present physically in the sacrament should be taken out of the equation because God's word says it is. He's not asking me to understand it. Very important to understand that. God's not asking me or demanding of me to understand the fullness of the Holy Trinity because I can't. It's beyond me. God himself is beyond me. Right? Same thing with the, with the sacrament. So he doesn't want me to try to figure it out. He what? Is calling on me to believe what the Word of God says. All right? And that's what distracts a lot of people, is to say, because it doesn't fit my human reasoning, and I'm tasting bread and wine, um, therefore the body and blood must not be present. Now we, as Lutherans, understand you're tasting bread and wine because it is bread and wine. 
The bread and wine does not go away. It's not what we call transubstantiation, where there is no longer bread and wine, but all you have is body and blood. No, the scriptures say very clearly, he takes bread, he takes wine, within those two elements, in, with, and under, we say, the bread and wine, there is the very true body and blood of Christ. So what you taste is real, bread and wine. What you don't taste is the body and blood of Christ. This is beyond your taste buds, okay? So what we have there is all four elements are there, bread and wine, uh, body and blood. And we receive this by faith because God's word says so. Okay, make sense? Now, what's the importance of all of this? Well, let's get into that. I'm going to check my time right now. Yeah, like usual, I'm long-winded. But let me, let me explain to you why this is such a wonderful thing, the fact that uh, you're going to receive the very body and blood of Christ. I'm going to take you to a, and we'll get to this, if not today, then next week, okay? But I'll try to get to this. We will get those lessons done. We've got time. We're in good shape. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. Um, I went to a pastor's conference with uh, Pastor Shoemaker and Zexer and a bunch of other pastors. It was, a, it was the whole state conference, so the entire Indiana district was together. And we had a speaker. And this speaker was an extremely wonderful theologian, and he talked about the Lord's Supper. And he asked a few questions of all of us pastors sitting there listening to him. And he said this, I got a question for you. He says, at the beginning of the service, we just got done studying this, right? At the beginning of the service, uh, when you as pastors have the congregation rise and they confess their sins, and as the under shepherd of the great shepherd you turn around and using the keys of the kingdom, remember that? The office of the keys? Using the keys, you go, you, you say the words of absolution. You absolve the congregation. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you of your sins. Okay. And the professor said, when you gave absolution, how forgiven were the people? How forgiven were they? Were they 80% forgiven? And we said, no. Uh, were they 90% forgiven? No. Was there anything lacking? No. Could it be that they were only 99% forgiven? And we said, no. When we gave absolution, the, it was the forgiveness of Christ. He forgives our sins and he remembers them no more as far as the East is from the West. And he said, okay, so you believe they're 100% forgiven? Yes. Then he asked another question. Then why are you being redundant with the Lord's Supper? Okay, think of the divine service. At the beginning, we confess our sin. 